Anna told me how to wake up the pointer. Good morning. Um, we are delighted to have you here at, and I'm going to move this just slightly, um, here on the campus of New College of Florida. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to our talk today, which is part of uh, an academic conference we've been having this week on the topic of variabilities, which celebrates and explores the full range of humanness and our multiple variations with and among each other. Um, variabilities was founded by Dr. Chris Maltzi, who is probably online with us from the UK at the University of Winchester. And it was co-hosted this week between New College of Florida, the John and Mabel Ringling Museum, and the Tibbles and Circus Museum, um, and the New University of Winchester. Um, we had additional funding, and I just want to thank our funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Um, New College has a grant called Connecting Arts and Humanities, and the Ringling has a grant from the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, which also helped. This morning, I'm delighted to introduce to you, um, both streaming and in person, Dr. Rosemary, Rosemary Garland Thompson, um, who is not only, usually we go through people's you know, credentials and all the marvelous things they've done, and I'm gonna be very brief because there's just so much. Um, so she's not only Professor Emerita of English and Bioethics at Emory University, she is a disability activist. Um, she is also, I just wanna say, an incredible mentor to those of us who are coming up behind her, um, a generous interlocutor. She's always exchanging ideas and helping all of us to think better and think forward, um, and a real force. She's an amazing person, and I think you'll see that immediately. Um, most recently, I want to mention, she co-edited a collection called About Us, Essays from the Disability Series of the New York Times. You can buy this book. Um, I really recommend it. I've read several of them as they came out in the Times, but having them all together and all of those voices together is a really marvelous thing. And this, the talk this morning will be performing the ethics of disability. So thank you so much, and I'm going to pass the mic over.
Thank you, Miriam. And thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a wonderfully intimate audience. Um, I'm honored to be involved in this really wonderful uh, conference with colleagues, uh, new and familiar, um, here uh, at the Ringling Museum. I want specifically, of course, to thank my hosts, Miriam Wallace, Chris Mouncey, and Jennifer Lemmer, Lemer um, Posey here at the Ringling Museum um, for this really wonderful opportunity to be together and think together. Um, I'll begin with, as I do, with an access note, uh, and that is um, I will describe myself briefly. So I am a seniorish uh, and senior woman uh, in almost every way, and I use the pronouns she and her. I have silver hair, pale skin, black glasses, and I'm dressed in a black top and pants with a silver necklace. Um, and I want to say about my presentation today that it is quite intentional in its uh, aspiration to be as accessible as possible. And it does this by um, trying to, uh, to be available in multiple forms. So it's an ocular-centric uh, presentation. That is to say there are many images. The images are not essential, but they are illustrative. Um, and it will, the presentation will be available in multiple forms. So there'll be the visual aspect of it. Uh, that is to say, that will be in two forms. One is that this is being recorded and will be available on YouTube. We think maybe with captions and we hope with a transcript. We'll try to make that happen. Um, I will, of course, be speaking, so there will be an auditory aspect uh, of this uh, presentation. Um, and we will have captions uh, that will appear on the screen <laughs> uh, during the presentation. So uh, the idea is that um, if it will be as uh, accessible as possible in multiple formats um, for uh, people to access um, in multiple ways uh, with lots of, we hope, accessible features. So let me wake up everything here, including myself. Okay, as Miriam pointed out, uh, my title is Performing the Ethics of Disability. I'll talk more about that as we move through. Um, my first slide captures a slogan that is uh, crucial to the disability studies and disability culture movement, and that is the idea, this comes from the historian Douglas Bainton, that disability is everywhere once you know how to look for it. So we're going to look for disability together in a particular way. What I'm focusing on here today is what I call, where would we find, if disability is everywhere, where would we find performances of disability? Well, we'd find disability performance in multiple places that uh, I'm going to explore with you today. We find disability performance in literature, in music, in the visual arts, in dance, in sculpture, in design, in leadership, and finally, in ethics. Disability performance, I want to suggest or emphasize, crosses all genre, all media, all time periods, all aesthetic themes, and all cultures. In other words, disability is everywhere once you know how to look for it. So my question is, that we're going to explore today, what does finding disability performances do? And the answer to that, that I want to offer, is that it will reveal to us what I call the generative potential of disability performance. In other words, it will help us understand and witness, if you will, what disability, how, and what disability performance makes in the world 
and the worlds that it makes. In other words, and I'm reading from my slide, finding disability performance is an opportunity to explore, to redefine, and to make new, new stories about what it means to be human. And this is my crucial assertion in all the work that I do, and it's part of the work of disability studies and disability cultural studies as well. So this is not only my aspiration in my work, but I think it's shared by many of us who do work in this area. I'm going to introduce here a term that I have used in the past in my work about the exhibition uh, or spectacles of disability. And I take this word uh, from a, uh, a scholar called David Healy. And the term is infreakment. I like it a lot. It's an unfamiliar term, but it's also a term that tends to explain itself. And I'll read some information about infreakment, and we'll talk about it as I move through the presentation. So infreakment, I want to suggest, is a strategy of representation that uses exaggerated scale or form it uses asymmetry, hybridity, that is to say the mixing, the mixing of two different elements. Um, it uses unexpected elements, it uses disharmony, and it uses monstrosity. If these words speak to you, this is a helpful way to understand the process of infrequent, and we'll look at that a little bit more fully. I'm showing an image here uh, that is a painting done by a colleague of mine who is a disabled artist. Her name is Catherine Sherwood. And this painting is a reference to uh, a famous painting by Monet called Olympia. So it's a nude woman. Um, and what Catherine Sherwood has done in order to make reference to Monet's Olympia is that she has revised this uh, Olympia to make Olympia a disabled figure by putting a brace on Olympia's leg and superimposing an image of Catherine Sherwood, the artist's own uh, brain scan. She is someone who had a stroke a number of years ago and needed then to rework her aesthetic practices and to start drawing and painting with her left hand instead of her right hand. And um, she uses this imagery of her brain in all of her work. Um, she makes flowers out of these brain images and uh, Olympia's face is made out of these brain images and um, the hair is also made out of these x-rays. So this is a really interesting example of how uh, art in disability can use what I'm suggesting is the elements in of infrequent. Here we have hybridity, unexpected elements, disharmony, asymmetry, all put together in this image. Um, and you can go to Catherine Sherwood's uh, website and see a number of her other works. So I'm going to give you some examples of where we can find uh, disability performance. So we can find disability performance in literature. Uh, for example, Oedipus uh, the King, which is written by Sophocles, is in some ways the founding narrative of Western culture. And Oedipus's story is bookended by disability and the performance of disability. He begins with a damaged foot, this is what Oedipus means, and he ends uh, the story by disabling himself, making himself blind. Um, you know, these Greek tragedies are gory things. He gouges his own eyes out, and the illustration I'm showing here is that he's tearing at his clothes, and uh, this is from 1896, and the blood is running down his face. But it's a very dramatic uh, story of disability uh, in the world, and perhaps we could even make an argument that this is an image of uh, Oedipus uh, that uses infrequent as a, as a uh, rhetorical technique. Um, a few other examples from literature, this is my field. Um, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, 
Um, its protagonist is Captain Ahab, who is a disabled, he, he has an uh, amputated leg, disabled figure. Uh, from the 20th century, The Sound and the Fury, William Faulkner's novel. These are understood as being the most canonical and important American novels. Uh, and The Sound and the Fury turns on a disabled character, uh, Benji Compson, who has a cognitive disability. Um, there is much contemporary work done. I'm showing an image of the cover of my colleague Ilya Kaminsky's book called Deaf Republic. Ilya is a deaf poet. Um, and a cover here very briefly of the collection that Miriam um, mentioned, and that is essays from the New York Times about disability written by disabil people with disabilities, which is a very important um, as we say, uh, intervention in journalism. Uh, the visual arts and portraiture, I'll go a little bit more quickly. Of course, we have the very well-known work of uh, Diego uh, Velasquez, La, Las Meninas, uh, or the family of uh, Philip the Fourth. thank you, um, from 1656, and this is a portrait of some court dwarfs or court court little people. So there's a very uh, vibrant representational tradition of little people through uh, all of Western art. And there's actually a book about it by someone named Betty Adelson. Um, another Velasquez uh, picture, this is the dwarf Sa uh, Sebastian de Mora from 1636. Um, in terms of portraits and self-portraits, we have a number of portraits by Vincent van Gogh. For example, this is a portrait of the artist with a bandaged ear, the disabled, wounded artist. Uh, we have Frida Kahlo, who uh, portrays herself often. This is um, a 1944 self-portrait called The Broken Column, in which she uses a kind of um, magical realism, if you will, to portray the uh, braces that she has as well as the um, internal uh, columns and rods that she has along her spine that are part of her disability. So there's a lot of Frida Kahlo uh, disabled imagery uh, to observe if you're a fan of Frida Kahlo that goes way beyond her eyebrows. Uh, Lucian Freud, uh, again, these are just some examples. Um, has a uh, image here from 1995 of what he calls Big Sue Tilly. It's a nude, uh, a woman of size on a couch. Again, a very interesting portrayal which uses the methods of infrequent in order to do this particular portrait. Uh, this is from 2003, uh, a self-portrait, photographic portrait of a uh, fashion model named Matushka, who um, had her breast amputated as a result of breast cancer and uh, tattoos over her scars and um, has an entire representational archive of these self-portrait photographs, which um, are really quite interesting. A revision of the typical uh, expected nude here, the one-breasted Amazon fashion model, Matushka. Um, this is a wonderful portrait by Chris Rush called Swim 2. It's a, a lovely young woman uh, with her hair turbaned with a beach towel, um, and she uh, seems clearly to be a woman with Down syndrome in this beautiful uh, uh, profile portrait, which is very elegant in my view and very dignified. Um, a more well-known piece, this is uh, Diane, or Diane Arbus's. 1970 photographic portrait uh, called Jewish Giant at Home with His Parents in the Bronx, New York. It's a photograph of Eddie Carmel, uh, one of uh, uh, giants that uh, Arbus photographed along with his parents. And uh, what this uh, portrait uh, illustrates, which I think is very important, is how juxtaposition makes uh, scale uh, and therefore juxtaposition creates this giant uh, by picturing him uh, almost touching the ceiling of his family home and he's looking down on his rather astonished parents who are looking up at him. So the juxtaposition of the giant 
and the um, what we might call normate parents is what creates the infrequent of Eddie Carmel in this Arbus photograph. Um, here is a uh, portrait of the performer and writer Teki Lomnecki from 1999 by the uh, artist, the disabled artist Riva Lehrer, uh, which shows uh, Teki in her performance costuming, which includes her arm crutches, which is part of her costuming. We'll come back to the use of what we think of as medical equipment turned into aesthetic equipment um, in uh, disability representation and these forms of uh, disability infrequent. Um, this is the cover of Riva Lehrer's book, Golem Girl. Uh, it is Riva Lehrer's memoir, and all of her uh, portraits of people and leaders with disabilities are in this book, which I highly recommend. Um, some examples here from musical performance. Beethoven, for example, uh, was deaf when he composed his most important symphonies. Um, we have a long tradition of disabled performers. Uh, very particularly, they are uh, black uh, performers on the piano. Uh, Thomas Wiggins, uh, known as Blind Tom, was a savant performer in uh, part of the entertainment industry. Uh, much later, of course, we have Ray Charles in the 20th century and Stevie Wonder, and I'm showing images of all of them. And part of the iconography of this is the uh, piano itself, uh, as well as the uh, very fashionable sunglasses that go along with this genre of, uh, of uh, black uh, disabled performance. Um, this is a less well-known set of performers, but I wanted to include this in the uh, presentation today. These are not very good images. Uh, I apologize, but I'll explain. These are some of the performers uh, that were uh, caught up in the Holocaust. So I'm showing here um, a picture of uh, Perla Ovitz. Uh, and again, I, don't, I'm, I apologize for not having the proper um, uh, captions on this uh, slide, but that was a, some kind of a mistake I made. Uh, and the Ovis family performers, uh, they were a group of uh, both uh, little and uh, average size performers that were captured and um, were taken into Auschwitz. Um, there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, they were taken into Auschwitz and they survived because uh, Mengele was very interested, as you may know, in collecting uh, people of small stature or dwarfs. So this is a great story. And the other performer I'm showing here, I can't remember what her name is. As I said, I lost my caption here. Um, within performance, uh, of course, this is really interesting to think about Lady Gaga, uh, who is very controversial. She appeared performing in a wheelchair in Sydney in 2011. Uh, and uh, this performance asked a lot of really interesting questions about how uh, what we think of as medical equipment might be used for aesthetic uh, equipment. Um, and I'm showing another uh, image of her, uh, again, standing and dancing on wheelchairs. Uh, in the performing arts, uh, we have a long tradition um, showing here an image of uh, Sidney Portier in uh, Gershwin's Porgy and Bess from the film in 1959 and then a more recent version from 2011 uh, with Audra McDonald and Norm Lewis in the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, and of course, the whole story of Porgy and Bess, which is set in Charleston, based on actually an actual person, uh, the performer and street person. Uh, I think his name is Samuel Smalls, I can't remember right now, uh, that Porgy and Bess is based on. And of course, Porgy is understood as being a cripple, and the whole love story revolves around uh, Bess and Porgy as uh, a goat cart man or uh, a so-called cripple. Um, these images I'm showing now are of great interest and importance uh, here at the Ringling Museum. I don't know whether you have any of these images, but I'm showing uh, photographs. These are photographs that would have been taken um, in the uh, late uh, 19th century and sold. Uh, and distributed by the performers. These are two armless wonders. 
uh, Anna E. Leek, who is shown here um, eating and having tea uh, using her feet, which is characteristic of um, armless wonders in part of this entertainment industry that's documented here at the museum. And Charles Tripp, I just saw a wonderful uh, set of images yesterday in the museum here uh, about and from Charles Tripp, shown again with this um, very typical performance for Armless Wonders. And Charles Tripp is cutting up food and uh, drinking tea. Uh, and these are from, as I said, the late, uh, the late 19th century. Um, uh, again, part of the iconography of infreakment, if you will, um, from the uh, entertainment industry. And this is very important uh, documentation of what I call the labor history of people with disabilities. Because if you were born armless or born as Charles Stratton and Lavinia Warren were born, and that is unusual, they are people of small stature, being able to work in the entertainment industry was a very, very good job. And there weren't very many other uh, jobs available. So this is um, photographed by the famous American photographer Matthew Brady in 1863 of the uh, wedding of Charles uh, uh, and Lavinia. He was often, of course, called uh, General Tom Thumb. That was his stage name. Again, another uh, image that I think is really interesting, illustrating as Eddie Carmel's uh, a picture by De uh, Deanne Arbus illustrated, and that is how juxtaposition uh, and contrast creates infreakment. So we have a giantess here in the photograph by Charles Eisenman uh, that's in a collection at Syracuse University. And the giantess becomes giant in this photograph by being juxtaposed, that is to say, standing next to an average sized and frumpily dressed, I might say, uh, woman. And the giantess becomes uh, a great beauty who looks uh, in interesting ways a lot like the Statue of Liberty. Uh, this is a photograph of a uh, circus performer uh, at Coney Island, um, a uh, contemporary. This is from 1996 bearded woman. It's a woman named Jennifer Miller, who is a performance artist. And this is a photograph of Jennifer Miller nude. I think it's a really beautiful photograph. It's taken by the um, American uh, photographer Annie Leibovitz. And we see Jennifer Miller uh, with this really, again, hybrid uh, portrayal of, of uh, sex or gender in that uh, Jennifer Miller has a beard and breasts and a pubic triangle uh, that create this hybrid figure uh, that uh, brings maleness and femaleness, man and woman, together in one uh, photographic portrait. Uh, this is the performance artist Bob Flanagan, who had cystic fibrosis, and he performed uh, a number of uh, masochistic performances um, and uh, called himself a super, mas super masochist. And uh, he's shown here with uh, his characteristic uh, uh, oxygen uh, breathing uh, assisting assistive device um, and a number of chains. He's known for uh, it's a very difficult performance to watch. I've seen it before, not in person, but of uh, pounding a nail through his penis. Uh, this is uh, a one of our uh, most important performers and actors. This is Matt Frazier, uh, shown uh, in his costume uh, in the American Horror Story uh, freak show uh, season from 2014. Uh, Matt Frazier is uh, someone who has very unusual short arms. He calls himself a thalidomide. Um, and he uh, is uh, wearing a costume that is a, uh, a performance costume uh, in this uh, particular segment uh, with a flask, um, looking very much like Matt Frazier looks. He's very handsome. He looks a lot like the actor Cary Grant. Um, and he has extremely unusual short arms. So um, I'm hoping we see a whole lot more of Matt Frazier. 
uh, as we have seen a whole lot of um, our other, in my view, um, important actor, and that is Peter Dinklage. I'm showing here two images of the actor Peter Dinklage. One is in his role um, in HBO's uh, Game of Thrones, uh, where he plays um, uh, a, a very important role in which um, his small stature is part of the script, but it's not the entire script. Um, and this is a picture of uh, also uh, an Esquire magazine cover with Dinglish on this uh, cover, uh, looking very dapper. And there was a great interview with Dinglish uh, and about Dinglish that uh, Maureen Dowd from the Washington Post did uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, in which she called uh, Dinklage uh, America's first dwarf heartthrob. <laughs> and I thought that was exactly right. And this picture of him with a, a little beard and a great hairdo and a suit uh, was uh, a wonderful illustration of America's first dwarf heartthrob. This is Maison Zaid, who is a disabled comedian. Uh, in a TED Talk from 2013, uh, in which uh, Maizun uh, calls herself a, a sit-down stand-up comedian. She's seated in the chair here. She's part of a genre of uh, comedians who have cerebral palsy and who use part of their um, uh, unusual movements uh, as part of their uh, comedic act. And she's really very popular and, in my view, really very funny. Dance and gestural narrative. Uh, there are uh, many forms of disabled dance. So disabled bodies have created an opportunity in dance for a whole new movement vocabulary. Here's an image of Leroy F. Moore, who is a poet and has created a, he's an African-American man uh, with cerebral palsy and he has created a new uh, dance form, which he calls Crip Hop. It's a hack, if you will, of uh, hip hop, of course. And he also performs with the art collective Sins Invalid. Uh, this is an image of uh, Crutchman, Bill Shannon, that's his stage name. Uh, again, he uses um, crutches uh, with rockers on the bottom in order to create a, a set of uh, movement vocabularies of uh, hip hop. So he's dressed here, uh, he's a white man dressed in a white uh, suit uh, using his crutches um, as prosthetic aesthetic devices. Um, as Claire Cunningham, I'm showing here her, she uses arm crutches, or what we sometimes call Canadian crutches, as aesthetic devices. She has one around her neck, uh, one on each arm, um, along with her black opera gloves and her black evening gown, um, and a rather truculent scroll, uh, uh, scowl on her uh, lovely face, and then one more arm crutch around her ankle in this really wonderful um, supported uh, position here of contemporary dance. This is David Toole, who uh, recently passed away. He danced with Kanduko. He is a uh, legless dancer, a man born like Johnny Eck from the um, uh, early entertainment industry, born legless. And um, I'm showing him here in his uh, usual posture, and that is he dances on his arms rather than dancing on legs. And it is, of course, imagined that legs and dancing on legs is an essential part of dance. And this is what is so interesting about, in my view, the work of legless dancers is to introduce a whole, not just a whole new movement vocabulary, but a redefinition of contemporary dance that um, has to do with leglessness. And he's in this beautiful fan skirt designed by the late English fashion designer Alexander McQueen. It's a white, uh, gorgeous, as I suggested, fan-like skirt. And skirts, of course, are a marvelous um, costuming for legless uh, people. And of course, there's a lot of gender and sex um, uh, hybridity here where we have a man uh, who presents as a man wearing a skirt. 
This is an image of Alice Shepard and Laurel Lawson from Kinetic Light, uh, which is a uh, wheelchair dancing uh, ensemble. Uh, this is from 2017, and uh, Alice and uh, Laurel are engaged uh, in their wheelchairs in some of the uh, virtuosity that they have developed in their own movement vocabulary uh, with uh, wheelchairs. And these uh, performances, I believe, are available online, and uh, they're still um, doing new performances that are really quite wonderful. I recommend trying to find this work. Um, my last image here, I think, in dance um, is uh, a performance, uh, I don't have the date here, I'm sorry, I think it's probably 2017 or 2018. Uh, this is an image from the London Royal Opera House of the character of Frankenstein in the Frankenstein Ballet, which is choreographed by Liam Scarlett. Um, and I saw this myself in San Francisco twice. I was quite taken by the challenge of having to uh, represent the relationship between the creature uh, and his creator, Victor Frankenstein, who were in the novel portrayed as being very opposite of one another. The creature is extremely huge um, and creature-like, and Victor is average-sized. But in a ballet, of course, they are restricted in this representation by the conventions of ballet, that is to say they both had to be ballet dancers that looked very much alike. And um, it was a very interesting aesthetic challenge in terms of representation to tell the story through balletic movements and music with no words, no text. Um, so if you have an opportunity, if you're interested, um, you can get a video of this, um, which is, is very good. This is a still taken, I think, from the video. Oh, there is one more uh, performance. This is Christine Sun Kim in a TED Talk. Uh, I highly recommend finding Christine Sun Kim. She is a deaf um, sound artist, and uh, her point is that deaf people have a very vibrant relationship with sound, and this is what she brings forward in her work. She's giving a TED Talk here in American Sign Language from 2015. Uh, sculpture. Uh, I'm beginning here with the representation of disability in sculpture with the most famous uh, double amputee in all of Western art, and that is the Venus de Milo from 1000 BCE, uh, 100, I'm sorry, BCE. And one of the representations that carries forward uh, this aesthetic uh, form of armlessness, remember Annalique, who was an armless woman from the 19th century that I just introduced you to. Um, and on the right here from 2005, we have a representation of marble sculpture, again, uh, of Alison Lapper pregnant. She is a woman, uh, a uh, armless woman. This is uh, displayed in Trafalgar Square, done by the artist Mark Quinn. She's armless with unusual legs, and she's shown here, of course, breasted, but the other inflection in Mark Quinn's 2005 sculpture is that Alison Lapper is pregnant. This is the uh, disabled artist, uh, late artist, she passed away in 2005, Judith Scott, who um, uh, is an artist uh, who was non-speaking, uh, had Down syndrome and uh, autism, and she is uh, really one of the most important American sculptors. She uh, began her career in a sheltered workshop in Berkeley where she began simply taking the fibers that were available there and wrapping um, and making sculptures. She never commented ever about her work, uh, but she worked uh, consistently uh, throughout her entire career as a sculptor. And um, there was uh, the first one woman sculpture show was at the Brooklyn Museum a number of years ago. And this is, I think, a wonderful photograph of Judith Scott. It's a black and white photograph. And she's holding, embracing uh, one of her own uh, wrapped <clears throat> sculptures. That's um, W-R-A-P-P-E-D, but one could think about that in different ways. 
<coughs> in design. Um, I'm showing here uh, some of the fashion design that's done by people with disabilities. This is a pair of shoes designed uh, by the artist Sandy Yee, who has unusual hands and unusual feet. And she's designed these marvelous shoes that um, fit her feet with horns that go between her two toes. Beautiful shoes, in my view. Uh, this is, <coughs> excuse me, a um, wonderful prosthetic designed uh, by the Alternative Limb Project in England. You can go and look at some of these prosthetics. This is called a snake arm. It's an aesthetic prosthetic rather than a, or a cosmetic prosthetic rather than a functional prosthetic. And it is um, a beautiful uh, hand with an, a snake wrapped around the forearm and wrist. This is an air, ear chair, which takes uh, the typical, I think these are called Windsor chairs, uh, I'm not sure, um, and I should research that. Um, the typical shape of a uh, Windsor chair, uh, which has wings, and these wings are exaggerated. Again, they're in freaked, if you will, by being made to be very, very, very large. And the two chairs are opposite one another, and people are sitting in those chairs, and the chairs themselves amplify communication uh, between the two people so that they would be um, understood in some ways as a disability prosthetic device. Um, but they're very beautiful in their uh, communicative, communicative infreakment. And finally, um, I'm showing an image here of the ramp, the ramp being, uh, in some ways, the central iconic figure in design of disability culture, uh, disability integration, disability justice, uh, the iconic emblem of people with disabilities being able to enter into public space as a result of the ramp, and this is a beautiful red helical lamp. It's a spiral, much like the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, ramp uh, in the Guggenheim Museum in New York. You may, might have seen that, which is not understood as an ADA-compliant ramp, uh, but rather as a design feature. And uh, what's interesting about this ramp is that it sits in the very center of the building and it's red and it is the center of the building. And um, when buildings began to be retrofitted to make them accessible for people with disabilities, it was often understood that by fastening an ugly ramp onto the front of the building, you were ruining it uh, aesthetically and also in terms of its value, real estate value. And uh, over the 35 or 40 or 50 years more or less since the ramping of the built environment was mandated by the federal government. Uh, architects and designers have uh, brought the ramp uh, into the very center of architecture and into the very center of aesthetics uh, in really wonderful ways in um, uh, bringing accessibility materially into the built environment. So it's a great example of this. Um, finally, uh, the international symbol of access, which is, uh, again, a ubiquitous symbol uh, that is uh, visually accessible, but also uh, accessible in Braille and also auditorily in many places. Uh, and I'm showing the 1968 original design, which is a stick figure, uh, blue on white, of a wheelchair user, again, the icon of disability access and uh, disability integration and disability justice uh, and disability rights, uh, which is a, a rather static figure, but very familiar as a, a pathfinding uh, aid for uh, all of us uh, in getting our way to the ramps with our rolling suitcases and bicycles and skateboards, I might add. Uh, whether we're wheelchair users or not. Uh, but from 2010, this uh, image has been uh, revised uh, by Sarah Hendren and others. And so we will often find uh, uh, our pathfinding emblem uh, to be the more dynamic, and of course it's controversial, the more dynamic uh, image 
that uh, I'm showing on the right here of the uh, more uh, agentic or the figure that has more agency suggesting the self-propulsion of many uh, wheelchairs now that was not the case uh, as much in 1968 when wheelchairs were transitioning, as I suggested, from medical equipment into what they are now, and that is to say uh, sports equipment and uh, transportation equipment that is often self-propelled. So this is a really interesting uh, contrast, I think, between how we imagined uh, dis people with disabilities out in the world in 1968 and how we imagine uh, us in 2010. I'm going to end with a section on leadership to show you uh, or share with you some uh, images of leaders with disabilities that are people who um, have the embodiment of many of the uh, performers that uh, in the early entertainment industry that you see documented here at the Ringling Museum uh, are people with these forms of embodiment or what we sometimes call conditions. This is my colleague, the bioethicist and computer engineer from the University of Cal Calgary. His name is Gregor Volbring. He is a person, uh, he calls himself a thalidomide. Someone was born with a very unusual body like Matt Frazier. And like many of the entertainers that we saw, uh, that we see in the uh, early uh, 19th and early 20th century entertainment industry, which is pre-thalidomide, but what you still see is very similar embodiments. Um, and this is a form of embodiment with unusual arms and often unusual legs uh, that is regularly occurring one way or another in the world. And this is from uh, a documentary called Fixed, which I highly recommend, uh, in which Gregor Volbring is his in my view, very best self. Another example here, this is the late um, Paul Stephen Miller, who was a law professor and disability advocate um, in the uh, Democratic administration. He was one of the EEO commissioners and also a professor of law at the University of Washington. Um, he uh, was a person with uh, dwarfism, the specific kind of dwarfism that we sometimes call a chondroplasia. There were many entertainers, of course, in that genre of being. Um, and um, toward the end of his life, uh, he had uh, a number of forms of cancer, and one of his arms was amputated. And um, he had a great sense of humor, and he said he was the first one-armed Jewish dwarf to ever be in the White House. <laughs> this is the British actress and comedian and anti-euthanasia activist. Uh, she has a, uh, a um, video, I think, that she calls a euthanasia road trip where she goes to euthanasia sites and protests. Her name is Liz Carr. She's also an actor um, in a very successful BBC series uh, called Silent Witness. She's a wheelchair user uh, and, um, and an entertainer. She wrote um, a really wonderful musical called uh, Assisted Suicide and starred in it herself. This is another, again, a small person. And this is uh, my colleague and friend, Rebecca Cockley. Uh, shown uh, with President Obama. This is, well, during the Obama administration when she had just been appointed executive director of the National Council on Disability. And I really quite love this photograph because uh, as you are uh, perhaps familiar with, presidential photographs are very highly conventional um, images uh, where we have flags and the president shown with every kind of person there is. And I think this is really a, a quite wonderful juxtaposition because Barack Obama becomes almost a giant uh, here, uh, juxtaposed with Rebecca Cockley. And yet this is a very, very familiar, very professional kind of photography. And Barack Obama, of course, is understood or can be read as a black man in this image. And Rebecca Cockley, with long red hair, can be read as a white woman. And it's really quite a beautiful, uh, I think, image. Um, and <clears throat> expresses a great deal about how the world has changed from 
uh, the first decades of the 20th century uh, to 2000, uh, uh, the Obama administration, the first few decades of the 21st century, uh, when it is possible to have a black man who is president and um, a woman of small stature who has a very important job as the executive director of the National Council on Disability. Um, and finally, I hope finally, uh, this is again my colleague, uh, Teresa Degener, who is an armless woman, again, born armless, like um, many of the early performers that uh, are featured in the Ringling collection. She is now uh, a professor of law in Germany, and she is the vice chairperson of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UNCRPD. Um, and I'm showing her here with uh, one of her tailored suits that she had, they're bespoke suits that are um, armless, uh, like she is, and it's really a very beautiful suit with a fuchsia collar and she has pearls on. A few other leaders I want to show you. This is Joshua Mila, who is a leader at Lighthouse for the Blind uh, and the visually impaired and the slogan of Lighthouse, which I love, uh, this is in San Francisco, is we're the blind leading the blind and proud of it. Uh, and Josh Mila has, uh, he works now for Amazon actually and is doing really important work there. But he also has um, invented, I guess, developed, he's a computer engineer, uh, an app uh, that's called You Describe and it's a crowdsourced description of YouTube videos. So it's a Wikipedia for YouTube videos. And description has typically been controlled by the experts. And so opening it up um, as uh, Wikipedia opened up at, you know, knowledge entries uh, to uh, the public to describe these YouTube videos, which are very inaccessible to uh, blind uh, people, um, is a really important intervention. And uh, Josh has very unusual face. He has extensive uh, scarring across his face uh, so that we, uh, uh, one of his eyes is covered up. So he um, looks somewhat cycloptic here if you wanted to use the language of um, entertainment from the early uh, 20th century and uh, throughout history actually. Um, and um, so he's an updated cycloptic person. I don't know that he'd go along with that definition but he's an important leader in our community. So my last section um, is about some ideas and thoughts about how can finding disability performance build a more ethical world. This is what I promised you and I have some suggestions. Um, the implements of making a more ethical world for people with disabilities and for everyone. These implements, the instruments of this are the laws and covenants, I call them, that are about uh, disability justice and disability equality and disability integration. And I'm showing here, of course, a logo image of the Americans with Disabilities Act from 1990 and 2009, the ADA, which has mandated an accessible world uh, which aspires to creating an accessible public world uh, that we can all share together. And of course, it also mandates um, and gives uh, people with disabilities the right to request reasonable accommodations, which is what is necessary for people with disabilities to enter into the public world. Along with this, we have from 2000, oh, this has fallen off, I think it's 2006, uh, the uh, Convention, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It's not a felicitous um, acronym, but it's UNCRPD. And this uh, is an international treaty. The United Nations does not belong, does not sign on to this treaty. But this comes from the long uh, set of human and human rights treaties beginning uh, with the Declaration of Human Rights uh, from 1948 that founds the United Nations and many, many other uh, uh, United Nations documents, treaties, uh, of course, are about human rights, not just the Convention on 
they call it convention, uh, not just the Treaty on Disability, but of course there are treaties about a variety of different important um, uh, segments of the world population. So if we build what I call disability cultural competence, and this is what I've been introducing to you, uh, the elements of disability cultural competence, which I suggest all of us should have, and this is what we're working together on today. We've been specifically looking about at, at a thread of what I call disability cultural competence. And what we are all obligated to do to achieve disability cultural competence is to know our history, meaning the history of people with disabilities, but also the history of all of us to know our history, to know our culture and our arts, which I've been introducing you to today, to know our technology. I gestured in the direction of the kinds of technologies, like the ramp, that make it possible for all of us to share an accessible world, an accessible built environment, accessible public spaces, like the one we're in together today, and to know our rights. And with Disability Cultural Competence for All, and this is an ethical initiative, um, the finding the performance of disability, as I've suggested, will help us strengthen support for disability culture, for disability presence, and disability awareness across all civic institutions. Disability Cultural Competence will promote the development of ethical, cultural, technological, you see these words repeated, and legal supports for people with disabilities living as we are. In other words, not needing to be turned into non-disabled people, but rather living as disabled people in an accessible and just shared world and to develop practices that implement disability inclusion, diversity, and justice. So we have to have ideas, we have to have laws, we have to have knowledge, and then we have to have practice. And we have to build together. We have to build inclusive environments to support all human embodied flourishing. Human embodied flourishing is a term very common in bioethics, the area that I'm working in now, and I find it a very uh, compelling idea, what it means to flourish, and what it means to flourish in a body. Much work in uh, disability ethics uh, uses this kind of language, and I'm showing, uh, I think it's a wonderful picture. It's members of a deaf church congregation using American Sign Language. And so it's a, uh, a uh, collection of six people with some diversity, if you will, uh, amongst the six people, the kind of diversity we tend to expect, gender diversity, racial diversity, even a little bit of size and age diversity here. And they're all using American Sign Language um, uh, to communicate with one another. Uh, we want to try to shape environments. This is a, a language I like to use to shape. Uh, we want to shape the environment uh, to fit humans rather than shaping humans to fit environments. And this suggests some of the work I've been doing about gene editing, which wants to shape humans uh, to fit environments rather than to shape environments to fit humans. Uh, this is a very important bioethical issue. Uh, and political issue, of course, now. Um, and my suggestion is that if we all work together to develop disability cultural competence or do disability literacy, we want to call this, or disability practice, um, it will change attitudes, it will increase access, it will build community, and it will cultivate leadership. And I'm showing Barack Obama again here in an image from 2015, along with, uh, again, my colleague and friend, Haben Girma, who is a deafblind woman, who is the first deafblind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. 
And the fact that Haben Girma could be in the world, could go to Harvard Law School, get a good education, and be in the White House to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Americans Dis with Disabilities Act and meet and communicate with Barack Obama tells us something about the potential and possibilities of the world that we share together here. Thank you. Ah, one more phrase, sorry, I go on. I wanted to uh, leave you with a phrase I use a lot, a quote from uh, a late colleague named Nancy Mayers who wrote a wonderful book called Waste High in the World, A Life Among the Non-Disabled. Nancy Mayers was a wheelchair user and I, I love this idea waist high in the world because it suggests the kinds of juxtapositions that are very common in the entertainment industry that I've shared a little bit with you. And um, I'm showing the cover of her book, again, called Waist High in the World, uh, which shows a wonderful uh, image. Um, and I don't know what that image exactly is, but I think it's a Renaissance painting of a woman with her hands over uh, her pregnant belly. And um, this is what Nancy Mayers wants in the world. And this is what Nancy Mayers um, would have suggested that disability cultural competence and disability knowledge would bring us. And it would be the capacity co to conceptualize what she calls not merely a habitable body, one you can live in, but a habitable world, a world you can live in, a world that wants me in it. So there we go. Thank you very much for being here. And Miriam, I don't know if we have time for questions, how you want to handle that. Absolutely. Wonderful. And we're going to use the microphone for questions um, because that will create what I call a robust auditory environment for all of us. Uh, not just questions, but comments, mm -hmm. um, additions, yeah, critiques. This is uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. This and please say who you are. I was going to say, this is Madeline Sutherland Meyer. And um, when you started to talk about leadership, I expected to see Franklin Roosevelt. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about him. I, I, I went to the Roosevelt um, Memorial, I guess, uh, in January. And I think they fairly recently added a statue of him in a wheelchair. Thank you for bringing that yeah. up. I often show an image of Roosevelt driving his adaptive car. Uh, he was quite a figure, of course, and uh, I think it's useful to understand him as our first disabled president, which of course is not true. Almost every president that we've ever had had some sort of disability, but Roosevelt had a rather spectacular disability because as an adult, he had had polio, and um, the result of polio was that basically uh, he used a wheelchair every day of his life. But because the world, of course, in uh, the early 1930s and late 1920s was not accessible to him, it was a, uh, a homemade wheelchair. And if you go to Washington, D.C., to his uh, memorial there. Well, let me back up a little bit. So he had his adaptive uh, wheelchair, which was a kitchen chair with little caster wheels on it that he used. And um, he also uh, had uh, a, uh, another home, which is outside of Atlanta in Warm Springs, which was a rehabilitation center. He built a house there, it was called the Little White House, and you can go there and visit. I suggest that you go, it's really quite wonderful. And that's where he was out as a person with a disability. When he was in Washington, he was in the closet, <laughs> uh, or in the car, uh, or sitting in his wheelchair uh, as a person with a disability. Um, and 
What's important about the Little White House and the uh, exhibitions there and the Frank, the FDR Memorial in Washington, D.C., is that both places bring forward the complicated history of being a public person with a disability in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And there's an iconography of that, and there's a material culture of it. So if you go to Warm Springs, what you see is his wheelchair. You see the pools where he swam, where he brought other people with disabilities, other people who had polio, where he was, as I said, out of the closet as a person with a disability in this space. But there's also an interesting collection um, at Warm Springs of these canes. Because part of the, uh, you know, the uh, narrative is that he always kept his disability hidden and people didn't know about it. But in fact, these canes are a testimony, a material testimony to the fact that People knew about it. It was simply choreographed in a different way. So there are, I don't know, I have an image of it, but of course I didn't include it with this. There are maybe a hundred canes that were given to him by the heads of state. Just like if you've ever seen that exhibition of Madeleine Albright's pins that were given to her by uh, heads of states when she started to wear pins, and then she started to wear pins that would signal what was going to happen in these uh, encounters. Whether Roosevelt used these canes when he got around, because he, he had braces uh, that are at the Smithsonian, at the uh, National Museum of American History. You can see them. It's very moving to see them, because they touched his body, these polio braces that, uh, had his shoe, that went into his shoes and that, that strapped around him like a <clears throat> you know, leather girdle. Um, but um, it's, and his car, of course, was adapted so that he could drive it like people, um, you know, who need adapted, I don't know, cars now drive. So he was really a leader in developing, if you will, and using these adaptive technologies. So the controversy about the uh, FDR memorial is that it was designed uh, as a series of what they call rooms. Um, and it's an outside memorial. If you haven't seen it, it's really quite wonderful to go to. And um, it was designed by the architect Lawrence Halpern. And when it was designed, uh, there was uh, one statue of FDR, which is an unsettling statue. It's way out of scale. It looks like a giant uh, or like Soviet... 1930s architecture, you know, and you can see the, it, the, he's got the cape on and the dogs there, and you can see the little casters, but it's, he really is pretty much in the closet in this statue. And so, of course, this is Washington, D.C., and I think it's the 1990s uh, or late 1980s, and um, so there's a, an enormous protest <laughs> by people with disabilities that Roosevelt is not being represented as a person with disabilities. And uh, they make a call to change the memorial to represent, uh, to get a representation, a statue of FDR in his wheelchair. And what they want is a statue that is uh, taken from a photograph. And there are very few photographs of FDR in the wheelchair, but there's one photograph. And so they want a statue uh, to be added uh, to this room. They want a room with a statue in it. And of course, Lawrence Halpern, the famous architect, says, you're not messing with my design. So a, a well-known writer uh, who was a biographer of uh, FDR, his name is Hugh um, uh, Gallagher, uh, who I actually knew, he's died now, um, got a hold of, he'd written a book called Splendid Deception about FDR. And Hugh Gallagher had had polio and was a wheelchair user as well. And so he um, invited Lawrence Halpern to, to go with him to Warm Springs and to witness FDR's life as a disabled person in a community of other disabled people. And so when Hugh 
Gallagher went with Lawrence Halpern, at least this is the story, um, Lawrence Halpern was completely converted and then agreed to cooperate and the, the room that we now see was added and the sculptor, his name is Robert something or other, did this life-size bronze wheelchair of, uh, I mean, sculpture of FDR in his wheelchair with this, I'm sorry, with his, you know, uh, cigarette, what do they call it, cigarette holder. holder, the long, you know, and the hat. And um, it's really quite remarkable uh, now because, uh, you know, how bronze statues witness uh, the uh, uh, tactile, the haptic engagement of the visitors. And so when you go to the memorial, you can see that the dog's nose, the dog is like as big as I am. Like I said, it's kind of creepy. Uh, but the dog's nose and the dog's ears are all bright. And, but when you go to the wheelchair, you can see that people have had a, ta a tactile, a haptic relationship with that wheelchair. It's, you know, he's rubbed all over the place. Um, and uh, so it's really quite wonderful, as I said, witnessing to, um, to this, and I was in DC at the time, and there was a committee to choose the inscription, and I got invited along with a whole bunch of other people to be on the committee, so we, we got a little bit of involvement there, and we got invited to the um, Library of Congress uh, Great Hall when they had the opening and the dedication, and uh, Clinton, who had helped raise the money, because of course it couldn't come from federal funds for it, was there, and um, I was, standing there, I was excited to, to be there, and I looked next to me and I thought, what is happening? This person next to me looks like Lauren Bacall, and then next to that looks like Angelica Houston, you know, and it's a celebrity sighting, I don't get a celebrity sighting, and I was trying to figure it out and trying to figure it out, and eventually it was announced that the sculptor, his name is Robert something, and I think he's died now, um, who was this dashing figure, the person who had, had sculpted or made the, um, uh, the statue, was uh, Angelica Houston's husband. Um, and Angelica Houston is good friends with Lauren Bacall. And so there were celebrities there. Uh, I mean, it was just, it was really quite amazing. And so whenever you make a pilgrimage, to Washington, D.C., be sure to go to the FDR Memorial and, you know, it's, touch it and try to go to, to Warm Springs and to see um, the exhibitions there. Um, because, you know, disability is everywhere, so disability is in every, um, it's in every archive, it's in every public space, it's in every museum. Um, we just have to try to find it. So thank you for asking. Long story. So we, we did have one question that came in um, on my phone from a colleague who's sitting at the airport. Um, and I'm gonna try to get this right, but she was really taken by that repurposing of Monet's Olympia. Uh, I was really thinking about, if you don't mic just go off. There it is. Um, and was thinking in particular about how, how we, it's always something, right? <laughs> Do you want to use this, or you can say it, and I'll repeat it and repeat it. So the question was really about how we um, can think you think back. about, or can you point to some other examples of representing intellectual or mental disability or difference, because the 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 long history of physical difference is much much clearer. But that was a really interesting image, right? Um, in terms of representation. Um, representing what we think of as neurodiversity, which I think is a great word, um, is a representational challenge. Uh, there are recognizable, um, visually accessible marks. For example, that's one reason I showed the portrait uh, by Chris Rush of uh, called Swim 2, which is the picture of the woman with Down syndrome. Um, in this very um, conventional 
um, pose of classical portraits. I often show that along with a Renaissance portrait of a woman. So these profile portraits are part of a long aesthetic tradition. So calling on aesthetic traditions, which is what Catherine Sherwood does, um, is, is one way to get meaning into this. Uh, but um, it's more of a challenge to represent neurodiversity. And there's a very good book by uh, my colleague Sandra Gilman called Seeing the Insane, which is a collection of representations uh, starting very early of insanity or madness. Um, and of course, these are representations of a form of neurodiversity uh, that are part of a kind of visual archive. And um, the book itself is, I think, a really excellent um, primer in the problem of representing uh, what are understood as uh, invisible disabilities. And uh, it has to do, of course, with expression and with comportment and with context. So some of these uh, that are collected in uh, Gilman's book are photographs. Um, I'm having a little trouble coming up with the name, but there was a French photographer. So once we have photography, of course, in 1849, what this does is that it brings the conventions of what we think of as truth or reality to representation. And so we have a lot of pictures of people with disabilities, a lot of pictures. These are medical pictures. A guy, I think it's called Hugh Diamond. I'm not sure. It's a, a Photography. These are medical photog photographs of insane people. And then there's a French photographer who takes a lot of photographs uh, or does some painting of insane people. That's right. Um, oh, man. It, it's a French portrait artist. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, the categories of neurodiversity shift. So these are people with melancholia and people with, um, again, I'm forgetting what these diagnostic categories are, but they're not necessarily the diagnostic categories we'd use today for neurodiversity. These are, people are, are represented, but they're facial representations. So it, it is difficult, but props help us, um, I think, and posing help us recognize neurodiversity represented um, in the same way that props help us recognize physical disability. I mean, to understand Frida Kahlo as a disabled artist, you, you have to see her in the wheelchair, or you have to see her uh, clothes, uh, which were designed as, you know, to accommodate her disabilities, if you will. And you have to have some uh, uh, narrative to help you recognize the disability, so I think that that's the complexity is in some ways, I, I never thought about using this word, you might need a, find, a set of finding aids to find disability, to know how and where to look for it. Yeah, I think that's really helpful that there's an iconography and it's a language and we can learn to read it, which gets right. back to your confidence point. And it strikes me that the two images you showed us, I was thinking the, the beautiful portrait um, of the, you know, the the young woman with her hair up in the towel turban and the other one, that really interesting repurposing of Monet, they're doing very different things, right? right. right? One is, it you know, fits in with that movie we're talking about, where we're portraying her in the way portrayed bourgeois women and, and women worthy of portraiture, right? And yes, that's a beautiful way to put it. To, um, mm -hmm. to make... and referencing classical imagery. So yeah. that's great. Which, of course, is what uh, the aesthetic conventions of portraiture do, is that they surround the subject with the um, uh, implements, mm -hmm. which are signs uh, that help tell the story of who 
you're seeing and the very fact of being represented in the high aesthetic tradition of a portrait, oil portrait, is part of what I call dignity maintenance. Um, and that, yeah, I wrote a article that's a chapter in a book about museums that uses that portrait and a variety of others to try to uh, talk about how portraiture itself uh, can bring dignity and do uh, representational work and how it does that representational work. Do we have another question from the audience? We can certainly point to at least one. Or comment. Okay. Yeah. We might have to repeat this. So. Okay. Hopefully it will be working. No. Um, first, Rosemary, thank you. That was a, a beautiful compilation. I was thinking this morning's uh, discussion when John brought up stories that are hidden in the drawers in the museum's archives. Um, the work you did right here today helped draw lines amongst groups of individuals that I should have known to connect and yet would not have automatically. So thank you for that. Uh, I was really uh, intrigued by the conversation about medical equipment as an aesthetic. not even sure that this is a question, but just your thoughts on, on that relationship of the human body to technology to enable anything. Thank you. So the question um, is about um, equipment. And um, in my talk, I mentioned the um, transformation uh, of medical equipment into aesthetic equipment that uh, disability performance, if you will, or disability art uh, and disability narrative sometimes uh, can accomplish. And um, uh, Jennifer was asking about, or commenting, that this is also part of the material archive of circus performance in which um, uh, sort of what we might think of as prosthetic equipment. There's been a lot of really interesting work done on theorizing prosthetics. Uh, and to think about the fact that um, you know a pen is a prosthetic or anything is a prosthetic. That is to say it's an extension of the body. There's work done, everyone in the academic world knows about Donna Haraway's uh, famous essay about the cyborg. Um, and I, I think that's a really, fruitful conversation, um, which is usually had in terms of technology, but to bring it into the material culture of disability and aesthetic performance, and to think about a relationship between a wheelchair and a tightrope and a trapeze, and in this case, the crutches, uh, or any kind of costuming as a form of, of prosthetic, um, equipment that is a, a, a kind of extension of embodiment, uh, you know, a, a fusion of flesh and, I sometimes call it flesh and world. I like to try to be pretentious. Um, and thinking of the performance equipment uh, in this way, um, I think is very productive because even though you're not, these performers are not working in a medical context like a wheelchair or a set of crushes, crutches would be, uh, there is the uh, problem of the relationship between flesh and world and the limitations of the flesh, which is in some ways what uh, thinking about, you know, disability equipment it, it, these th these are material testimonies to the limitation of human flesh and fleshment. That's an even more pretentious word. I love it. Um, 
And that's what your circus equipment would be because in some ways these performances are about the limitation of human enfleshment. Uh, inflected by wonder, of course, we talked a lot yesterday about the, what I call the ancient affect of wonder and that um, these disability performances are about eliciting wonder, particularly, as is uh, circus work. Great, thank you. I think we might be done. I'm not a, get, seeing a sense that people have lots more to say. So thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you all you. for being here. Thank you everyone online. I think we're going to attend to the body, aren't we? We are. We're By going having to a go wonderful lunch together. Have something to eat, yes. It's such a gift to, um, and thank you, uh, Miriam and um, uh, and uh, Jennifer for gathering us together. I think for many of us, it's been very meaningful to uh, to be together in the flesh. <laughs> uh, it's been so productive, uh, and it's very tender. I think to think about the fact that we're form and function are coming together. <laughs> we're thinking about bodies and we're thinking and we're doing it with our bodies together. Um, so thank you both for bringing us here. Thank you everyone. Have a lovely day. <laughs>